Meet Bernard Tucker. Bernard's a farmer who tills the soil here back of Markland. The spring of the year is a busy time for Bernard. On days like this, you'll find him on his tractor, cultivating the ground. This was all woods a few years ago, and the moose still haven't relinquished their claims to the land. But it's not moose Bernard is concerned with now. It's spring planting. Pretty busy time now getting started because you get a few bad days, you only can work on the fine day. You got to punch land power for the sunshine. Probably got cultivated here now and ridged up as far as plant potatoes in. This is all for a potato crop. This is land we had. Some of it we had potatoes in last year and some we had turnips and cabbage. Uh, the frost won't make that much difference now because we don't have any greenhouse plants to put out real early or anything like that. Most of our crops won't be coming through ground, say, of any size until sometime in June. How does it look this year? Is this year shaping up to be a good year for the farmers? This year started off kind of wet and kind of cold, you know, compared to other years. Now, for four or five years back, we've had it pretty warm and pretty good weather in the last week in April and the first week in May. But this year, we've started off with a very, very cold, very wet. Your farm comes right down, right over the ridge here. You've got a lot of land here, haven't you? Yeah, we got, uh, all together, we got 275 acres, but we've only got about 60 acres of cultivated land. Now, you've had to clear right from the forest, all the way down All there. this land is right out of the woods. We never had a square foot here, down this area. We came down here first. Bernard is still clearing land, turning forest to farm. It's a lot of work before the raw forest land will produce. Trees must be cut and stumps must be pulled. The soil must be plowed, the rocks picked off. Then there's cultivating, liming, fertilizing, and finally planting. And uh, this is planting in the crop of turnips. You have to take your time, dodge your line. It's a bit tedious, and uh, it takes quite a while to plant in any great acreage, but there's no trouble to plant a couple of acres a day. We usually put in a pound or a pound and a half of seed to the acre. We always got a few rocks, more than our share. Too bad they hadn't sent a few of these rocks over to PEI. It would have eliminated some of our competition. This is a bit of steep ground here. It makes it a little bit harder to work, but it's good soil, and in a wet season, you don't have no problem with damping off or ground too wet to work. If this crop grows the same as they did every other year, this should be a bumper crop. Just about every year we have an acre or two or three or four acres of new soil, virgin soil for turnip. And they usually produce a good AV crop. One time we could grow turnips as large as we could grow them. And now the supermarket only accepts a small turnip. So we have to plant turn it fairly close together and rows fairly close together. The row spacing here now is a bit closer than you normally would see. These rows are only 17 inches apart. The population of plants here should range probably 35,000 to the acre. It takes quite a bit of cultivation and rock picking to clear out a piece of land from the woods and make good farmland out of it. Next year, this soil here should be suitable for potatoes. A little bit of extra work on it. It's a beautiful day here to work on the farm today. A bit of sun and a breeze of wind to keep the flies down. Nippers and black flies can be a bother on a farm, but at least they don't ruin your crops. It's a much bigger creature that does that. There are lots of moose around Bernard's farm, 
just waiting for those turnips and cabbages to grow. Bernard and the moose have been mortal enemies for some time now. But this year, for the first time, Bernard faced a new foe. This is the way I put my label down from my seed. Now, I added a, a villain here last couple of days, a bird, pulled all my labels out from under the rocks. I had several markers here, and now I can only find one. Now, this, this seed package is the variety of seed is set in, the, in each roll, see? And I left it there with a marker. You can see the way the plastic has been tore up. A gull or a crow decided to have a picnic on plastic and he pulled all my markers out and now he got to put away. And uh, I got to wait till the seed grows now to see what I got growing there. And uh, I'd say for an inexperienced farmer, he wouldn't know whether he had cauliflower now or hurly cabbage in the hills. When it, when it comes up, he wouldn't know his seed. But usually I keep the mark there like that. I put it back under the rock again. That's to mark my cauliflowers. But uh, the moose is trouble enough, but now the ghost is starting to turn on me too. The farmer wages war on many fronts against the moose, the gulls, and the deadlier enemies, insects and weeds. This is the first sign you see when you notice know time to start spraying for weeds. Well, it's referred to as ground cracks. The first sign of a potato starting to bow through the ground. There they are right there. There's the spout of the, of the, of the potatoes. When you see the, 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 the ground cracks, then you have to start spraying for weeds. And so the war begins. If the farmer doesn't control the weeds, they'll choke and destroy his crops. It's a costly battle, but one commercial farmers must fight if they are to survive. And it's one we consumers must tolerate unless we're willing to pay $20 a pound for turnips. Weed control is routine work. It's far more difficult to control insects on the farm. They're smarter. Most of the insects' timing is all that controls them. If they get a chance to breed, well, then you got to, they multiply by millions. I believe the insects are getting a bit smarter these days, too, you were yeah, saying. Yeah, they certainly are. We're getting superbugs now, they're, they're referred to in many cases. Some of them resist the insecticides, and uh, they, they, they watch the season, and when they see you spraying, they hide away. And after the spray is gone, then he comes back. See, that's what happens. So I guess there's... Well, I guess it's all the technology. And the, the methods of spraying for the insects and everything is after changing their seasons and changing their habits a bit so that the, the insects always don't, you don't show up at a certain time. And timing is essential on the sprays. If you want to control root maggot, there's a little small black fly that spits the, the, the lava. If you can get uh, your spray there when he's spitting the lava, you've got no worries. But if you got your spray there for two or three weeks and they shows up, well then you got to keep on spraying again. So you figure this is a good day to do it, do you? Oh, it's a perfect day for the weeds. The weeds are, are ideal, but we haven't got no problem with insects yet. The insects, are, uh, they're, they're really shy until the weather gets warm. Most seeds are planted after all danger of frost has passed. Some, like these young cabbages, get an early start in special transplant beds. Yeah. They're almost big enough to plant now. Yeah. Give them another week to 10 days, we'll be able to take them out of this field now and put them in the main fields. The, the roots are looking good, nice healthy roots. They've had a couple of weeks of very cold, wet weather on them, and sort of slowed them down a little bit, but they're doing okay now. We'll have them out on schedule. That's good. Now, if you had to buy these uh, commercially, how much would they cost? Well, we're planning on growing 100,000 plants there, count cauliflower and cabbage and broccoli all together. And some nurseries are charging $90 a thousand for them. So you're talking about uh, around eight or $10,000 worth of cabbage plants. And so the young plants on Bernard Tucker's farm take root and begin to grow under the warming sun. But there's one crop you won't find on the supermarket shelves, grass. By mid-June, you'd scarcely find a greener field in old Ireland. This, this could be a bumper yield here. You're talking about now 15th of June. Now 
the 20 inch flat. And this is only the 15th of June. The 15th of July now will be twice as long as that. Now what have you got this for now? What do you use this hay for when you when you cut it? Hay is only sold to dairy farmers or people who got cattle around. It's only just growing the hay for sale. We don't need to keep no livestock. Cows and uh, vegetables don't mix very good. You got to be doing a lot of fencing and everything. And the land is all in patches all over the place, so any hay we grow, we just offer it for sale. Some of it is sold right off the field. Some of the dairy farmers now and people keeping uh, beef cattle, they've came on the field and bought the hay right off the field when, they, when we're bailing. We used to start the 20th of July, but this year I'm going to go probably the 10th of July we're going to start cutting. We got probably 10 or 15 days earlier we can cut this year. Hope that the weather is going to be good. Few farmers could survive working completely on their own, and Bernard is no exception. His wife pitches in, and so do his daughters. Bernard's youngest daughter, Liza Ann, and her friend are working on contract. We don't have to pick the weeds out of this one. It's mostly full of sally suckers. So we just have to thin them out. In the other gardens, we had to get all the weeds. Build them up. This is our last garden we're doing now. We're after doing three for dad, uh, each of them about three quarters of an acre. And, and we one did about that was one third of an acre. For her father yesterday. So after we finish this, then this will be it for thin turnips. And we'll go back to uh, weeding cabbage, and then when we go taking up the potatoes, we'll be doing that too. Every plant along this row now look for 25 or 30 feet. The moose have chewed the tops off. Now it really don't affect the plant. The plant will grow again, but if he keeps on chewing them down, he'll stop the growth. He'll, he'll stop some growth, but it won't destroy the crop. If they're left alone, they'll gradually eat them down close to the turnip, and then they start eating the turnips. And when we see damage like that, now we, we have to destroy the moose pretty soon. Or if not, we'll have a lot of damage in the crop. It doesn't take very long. Now, probably he only spent a few minutes there and he gnawed off three drills for, well, this one he only got about 15 or 20 feet, not off this one. He got 25 feet in this one, or 30, but another 30 feet in that one. And he was only just picking up a snack. Give him a couple of days there, and he'd, ha he'd have a quarter of the field gnawed down. It won't really kill the plant or anything like that, but it sets him back a lot. If you look at the the leaves have not been chewed off, it has a purpose, it supplies the, the plant with all kinds of oxygen and everything that the plant needs to grow. But when the leaves are chewed off like that, now the plant gets shriveled a lot, because it hasn't got, uh, it's not able to pick up a supply of energy. So, you know, most people might think that the moose only eating a few leaves off and not going to hurt the turnips, but put the garden back, it doesn't take very long when you got 25 or 30 percent of your crop gone. Dad is coming now. Usually when Dad comes, we speed up. <laughs> the first day we did it, we went up through the drills and we were going like about a half an hour drill. And then as soon as Dad came, we were going and we were going How about 10 minutes to drill. Pretty good. This pretty one's done. Right? Yeah. You're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, it's easier than the last garden. Plants are bigger, so it's easier to thin. Yeah. You're doing a fine job. As long as you keep your proper distance apart. Don't have them clustered or grow tangled up. Two small weeds, they don't matter. The cultivator can handle them. As Bernard predicted, the hay crop turned out quite well. The fields responded to the rains of spring and summer. A far cry from last year when drought parched both hay fields and crops. With so many dairy farms in Newfoundland and such a scarcity of hayland, Bernard has no trouble selling his hay.
The rains were good for the hay, but not for the crops. Parts of Bernard's fields suffered. This is what happens to the field where the, the water lay, and it was too wet all, all the season. You can see we got a plant there, a potato plant there, only about four inches high, flowered out, so you can be sure that you won't see any potatoes on that one. Potatoes now is something that's a hard job to make money on potatoes because they're mass produced everywhere else. New Brunswick, PEI, Nova Scotia, Maine, all, all, all over the place there's potatoes mass produced by big companies and uh, a small farmer now can't compete with them at all. Like we're growing potatoes there now, we only got nine acres planted. We got a limited amount of machinery and everything has got to be pretty well done by hand, so the, our potatoes is worth a lot more than theirs are. They can use all, everything is mechanical. Everything is done by machinery. We get to dig them and pick them by hand, and raid them by hand, and bag them by hand, and it's all, the labor is worth more than the potatoes is worth now. Bernard's not the only Newfoundland farmer to swing away from potato production. Cabbage, turnip, and other vegetables are the mainstays of most farms these days. Midsummer came to Tucker's farm. The rains stopped. The sun beamed down. The pond dried out a bit. And the vegetables grew. And ripened. They can laugh at our weather and rocky soils all they like out in the fat, rich lands out west. Come harvest time, our local crops are as good as any and a lot fresher. Despite the annual flood of cheap potatoes from the Maritimes, some farmers continue to set a few fields in potatoes. Bernard was pleased with the way his crop was developing. These are as big as we need. They grow any bigger than that, they're too, too large for selling plastic bags. That size potato now, most, most everybody looking for potatoes in plastic bag, they'll buy them that size. They're nice and clean too. The ground is a bit dry today. The ground is a bit wetter, they'll probably be a little bit dirtier, but uh, leave them out for a while in the sun, they'll dry off and they'll be okay. Our Newfoundland soil is rocky, no question about it. And while that doesn't affect growth too much, it does affect the shape of certain crops, potatoes especially. It takes a lot of cultivation, a lot of picking to get the rocks out. And uh, machinery is what's necessary to pick out all the small rocks. These size rocks here, though, is what'll interfere more with the crop than the real large ones, because if you've got a lot of small rocks like that in among the potatoes, all the potatoes comes out with Poor shaped. That one got a big uh, dent in the side there. You see, that's where it grew up again a rock. And uh, that's the reason why most of the Newfoundland potatoes in some areas are not very well shaped. Because there's always, there's always somewhere or another they're leaning up against the rocks and they grow in poor shape. We got a small patch of turnips here and we set real early. This size here now can be sold in as bunch turnips. You just harvest these like that. Take off so much of the tops. And put three in a bunch. And they retail out in the supermarkets or peddlers retail them on the road. But most people, when they see the bunch of turnips tied up in a string, and they see the bit of green on them, they know for sure they're fresh Newfoundland turnips. And they'll pay uh, probably $1.50 for those three. And if you cut that one off there, without the stock, put that one in the supermarket now, and people wouldn't pay 25 cents for that one. 
The days begin to shorten. The sun begins to lose its power. Finally, it's harvest time. This is the climax of the year, the time when you find out if you've won or lost. It depends on how the plants have grown. It depends on the price in the marketplace. And it depends on how quickly and efficiently you can get the stuff out of the ground. Most of our workers now is, you know, like fellows that in between jobs. And we got a few fishermen there today came up for, for more or less a bit of sport rather than anything else and pick up a few spots. And well, we got, you could say we covers a wide range of pickers today. We got everybody here now from a Presentation Bay fisherman to Mother Teresa. She's a great grandmother over there somewhere <laughs> working in our town today. Seems like every year she comes back for three or four days. Our potato harvest only lasts about probably four or five days at the most. As we usually have a big crowd like we got here today, and <coughs> it doesn't take very long. We don't, we don't stay at it for any great length of time. I suppose it's a critical time of year for you. I mean, you've got to have everything organized pretty well, haven't you, at harvest time? Well, harvest time can be pretty expensive. Like, we're talking about 12, I think it's said 13 hens here today for 4 50 an hour. So you're talking about over $50 an hour. So that, that's working out $400 a day. So if you don't get a lot of work done, <laughs> you're going to have a job to pay your bills. You've got to get a fair amount of work done. Bernard's daughters don't plan to become farmers, but Liza Ann, who's still going to school, doesn't mind rolling up her sleeves and pitching in. For her, it's a job, a source of money, and so much the better if it's all in the family. I worked all summer this summer with my best friend, and we did approximately five and a half acres thinning and weeding turnips and cabbage. And we planted about a half an acre of cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. That sounds like a lot of work to me. It's not too bad because we took it on contract and we're doing our own hours and we used to go down there in the pond for a swim every now and then and we didn't have any boss, we were up here by ourselves so it was kind of fun and it was her, her last summer here so we got to spend some time together because she just moved away. It's almost like a family affair, it's your family but the other people almost seem like family, they've been coming here so long. Yeah well we're in such a small community, it's like um, the only people that you can get to work in here are like all related. Most of the people in the community are closely related, like they're in groups. So it's, you know, the Dobbins and the Clarks and the Lewises, they, they all work in here and there's, you know, two or three people from each family that always come in. And, and most of them have been working here all their lives. So it's not, uh, it's not hard to get people to come out at harvest time to help you just get on the phone, is it? Yeah, it drives me nuts because I'm trying to do my homework and there's always someone ringing and ringing and ringing wanting a job and can they come up in the garden and will Bernard call me tomorrow? So there's no problem. There's even people from Whipper and call in looking for a job. Here comes your dad now. I guess we better get out of the way. Every year differs. You don't see a complete failure when you got to, you diversify your crops a bit. If we had some livestock too, now it probably would help us. Livestock and vegetables don't mix. The moose is bad enough here. Yeah? You got plenty of moose here tracking around over the vegetables eating up, so I guess if I had a few cows along with that, I'd have a job saved. <laughs> It'd be a full-time job putting up fences. The harvest continued until the days of November, when the last crops were taken from the fields. Bernard is now selling the last of his turnips and white potatoes and the hay. He can't wait for spring to start up all over again. <laughs>